Okay, today we're gonna to talk about solubility and the effect of pH. So how does pH affect the solubility? Let's consider magnesium hydroxide. This is a solid, and if you think about the solubility, right, it'll dissolve in water, but only up to a point. It has a total solubility, grams per liter, or molar, molar solubility, moles per liter, that will fit in that water. But if you wanna think about this as more of a chemical reaction type scenario, you might write the following, magnesium two plus aqueous and two hydroxide aqueous, okay? And so now we have sort of this reaction, which is really just an equilibrium between products and reactants that is occurring when you place magnesium hydroxide in water. Now, how can we affect the amount of magnesium hydroxide solid that goes to the right and dissolves and becomes aqueous? Well, if we think back to our friend Henri Louis Le Chatelier, Le Chatelier's principle says if there was a way to remove product, the reaction shifts to fill that void. So if you remove some OH, the reaction will shift to the right, meaning more of the solid goes into the solution. So if we remove OH, we can shift the reaction to the right and get more of this magnesium hydroxide to dissolve. How can we do this? Well, one of the ways you remove OH minus is by adding an acid. And an acid, particularly a strong acid like HCl, right, really doesn't exist as HCl in the aqueous phase. It's basically all H plus and Cl minus. So if you're adding, you know, one molar HCl, it's really one molar H plus. In any case, if you add an acid to this solution where you have the hydroxide in it, this is an acid base neutralization, and you'll create some liquid water here, right? So now imagine that you have this initial setup where you've dumped some magnesium hydroxide in water. It's established an equilibrium where some of it is solid and some of it is in the aqueous solution form as ions. If you now add some acid to this, it will react and neutralize the OH minus, removing this and prompting more magnesium hydroxide to fill that void, okay? So this is how pH can affect solubility. As the pH decreases, here the solubility of magnesium hydroxide increases. And in general, as pH decreases, solubility increases for substances with a basic anion, okay? So while it's true and it's obvious to see it here for OH minus, this is generally going to be true for anything with a basic anion. So what is a basic anion? Well, you can think about something like lead fluoride, where the equilibrium here would be making Pb2 plus, plumbum, and two F minuses. Now, this F minus is a basic anion, and not just because it's relatively simple, but it's basic because it is the conjugate base of a weak acid, okay? So if you have a weak acid, something like HF, well, it's natural acidic nature donating H plus and F minus, okay? If this is a weak acid, then its conjugate base does act like a base. And so this F minus is a basic anion. Okay, so just like we had OH minus up here that we could neutralize, now imagine you have this F minus that you're adding H plus to. Well, if you have F minus that you're adding HF to, sorry, that you're adding H plus to, there is going to be this natural equilibrium to make the weak acid form. I've just written the reverse of this basic acid equilibrium for HF. So as long as this ion can combine with H plus to make its weak acid form, as long as it's a basic anion, 
and a base is going to accept a proton. So as long as this equilibrium exists and you get some making of HF, then adding H plus will remove this, shifting this to dissolve more and fill that void, okay? So there's still a weak acid equilibrium. And so adding H plus will still remove some F minus. Again, as pH decreases, by adding H plus, the more H plus you have, the lower the pH. So as you add H plus and the pH decreases, the solubility of this, but really most anything with a basic anion will increase. So that's how you can control the solubility. Now, it has to be a basic anion, right? If you're talking about HCl, this dissociates since it's a strong acid to make H plus and Cl minus. This, while it's the conjugate base of HCl, it's not really a base, okay? That's what makes a strong acid a strong acid is it's not really a two-way street. You don't really get this reverse reaction happening very much. We can just write it as a one-way arrow because for strong acids like HCl or HI, right? Or nitric acid, uh, okay, HBr, hydrobromic acid, these things are basically one-way arrows. There is no return, there is no double arrow like there is with this weak acid. So if your lead fluoride was really lead chloride and this was chlorine, then adding H plus doesn't remove the chlorine, it doesn't react remaking an acid, so there's no effect on the pH. We can see that in picture form with the two examples here. So the lead fluoride is what we talked about previously. If a substance has a basic anion like F minus, it will be more soluble in an acidic solution. Okay, so the lead fluoride, here's its natural equilibrium. But if I add a bunch of acid, then some of this H plus combines with HF, and there's more room for F minuses to go into the water space and get solvated. And that's what will happen. So any salt, like lead fluoride here, whose conjugate base, uh, sorry, whose anion, F minus, lead fluoride, whose anion, F minus, is a conjugate base of a weak acid, like HF, then the solubility increases as the pH decreases for all the reasons we outlined here, okay? Now, a salt like lead iodide, whose anion I minus is a conjugate base of a strong acid like, hello, hi, hydroiodic acid, then adding a bunch of H plus, like most of my jokes in the classroom, we get no reaction, okay? So that's because there's no equilibrium of H plus combining with I minus to make HI that's not very favorable. HI is a strong acid, it completely dissociates. So we're not able to encourage that process to make some HI here. So there's a net just still the same amount of I minus around. Okay, so that's the difference depending on the conjugate base of the weak acid or the, the strong acid and whether the pH is going to affect the solubility. Now, one more concept to touch on here is whether a precipitate will form, right? We've often been talking about, you know, adding this solid into a liquid and uh, seeing it dissolve, but at what point will precipitate form, okay? Maybe we remove some of the water, or maybe we're still adding solute and, and trying to see if we're before uh, the solubility point or not. And what we're going to do here is calculate a reaction quotient. And this is the same kind of reaction quotient we might've talked about with uh, acids, or bases or other aqueous uh, type solutions. But we're always comparing Q and K, right? K, remember, are the values at equilibrium. So this uses values after a long time scale once equilibrium has been achieved. But you don't always know in the laboratory if you've reached equilibrium or not. So what you do is you measure how much ion do I have in solution, okay? and calculate your quotient 
and see where you are relative to K. So let's pretend that we have barium sulfate, solid. The solubility equilibrium looks like this. Okay, the equilibrium expression K or Q really is going to equal products over reactants, but we don't include solids in our equilibrium values. So our equilibrium expression looks like this. Our reaction quotient expression looks the same. Okay, these are the same thing. It's just these must be equilibrium values. How much of each ion there are after everything's reached equilibrium. But again, in the laboratory, you might not know. So what you do is you measure for your solution, what is the amount of barium two plus? Maybe you can do that with lasers and spectroscopy. What is the amount of SO4 two minus? Multiply those two together. Does the number you get Q equal K? Then your reaction's done, right? You're at equilibrium. If you are less than K, then more solid can dissolve, right? Q less than K, right? That means you need more of these ions than you are measuring, okay? Which means you can go more to the right in this scenario, right? So if Q is less than K, this is favored because you need these numbers to be higher so that when they're multiplied together, you get the value of K. If Q is greater than K, then you're too far to the right and it needs to come back to the left, which means solid will spontaneously form and precipitate out, right? So that's one uh, sort of wrinkle here that we sometimes use in the laboratory is that there's technically a difference between Q and K. They're calculated the same one. Only K is strictly for being at equilibrium, right? We use Q and we calculate by multiplying together these concentrations for our aqueous substances to see, are we at this equilibrium value? Are we before it? Are we after it? Is it going to precipitate or is it going to dissolve more? Okay. So finally, the last thing I want to talk about is putting this into perspective and talking a little bit about pH and the solubility in oceans. Now, coral reefs are an important part of the food chain of really all marine life. And an exoskeleton on a coral is actually made of calcium carbonate. So really what happens is we can think about, well, the ocean, but let's pretend the ocean fits in here. There's our ocean. Great. Right. And down here we have our little coral guy. And he's made up of calcium carbonate, C8, CO3, and that's a solid, okay? But this calcium carbonate has an equilibrium with seawater. So we can draw an actual double arrow equilibrium, calcium two plus, and carbonate, CO3, two minus, right? And so as long as there's these ions around in the ocean water, then this solid is okay. It's at equilibrium. It has lived, it has evolved, it has survived in this environment and built up its calcium carbonate, right? But there are things that could remove some of these ions. And remember Le Chatelier, if we remove some of these ions, then this will spontaneously dissolve. And the scenario or the implication here is this calcium carbonate, which is the exoskeleton of this coral, will simply dissolve into the ocean water. And so it won't have an exoskeleton anymore and the coral will die, okay? What happens here is you have uh, a bunch of uh, jerks doing this. Amongst other things, and adding a bunch of CO2 to the atmosphere. And we've learned about gas laws in the past on this channel that the more gas pressure you have above a solution, the more gas goes into the solution. 
right? The higher the capacity of that solution can dissolve that gas. So increased atmospheric CO2 from uh, humans burning fossil fuels or uh, destroying uh, forests means there's going to be more CO2 in the solution. And as there's more CO2 in the solution, it combines with water to make carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid is an acid, and acids are going to do what acids want to do and generate H pluses. Okay, so the more and more carbon dioxide you have in the atmosphere up here, the more goes into the solution. The more in the solution, the more you acidify the ocean. Okay, the higher the acidity in the ocean, the more H pluses, since that's what an acid is and what an acid does, the more H pluses you have floating around in the ocean. And finally, the more H pluses you have around, the more these H pluses can combine with CO3 2 minus. to make CO3 minus, HCO3 minus the anion, okay? So this is also an equilibrium that is established. So it's a bit long and involved, but more CO2 above means more CO2 in. More CO2 in means more carbonic acid. More carbonic acid means more H plus. Le Chatelier says if you add a bunch of this on the left side, we'll shift to products. And shifting to products means we're using up CO3 two minus. So all of this, the implication here is you're removing CO3 to minus from the water. And finally, that means the removal of CO3 to minus means this original reaction that forms the exoskeleton of the coral is compromised because we're removing CO3 to minus with all the H plus that we've generated from carbonic acid from carbon dioxide. And so this reaction lens shifts to the right. The exoskeleton of the coral dissolves. The coral itself ceases to exist. The only way we can prevent this, well, there's a couple ways, right? Uh, you could add a bunch of base. You could add a bunch of OH minus in here to cancel out all this H plus. But adding a bunch of base to the ocean is probably going to mess up some other stuff. Not a good idea. So really the only way to counteract this is to remove all of the CO2 above the ocean or some of the CO2 above the ocean. Then CO2 will come out of the ocean. There will be less carbonic acid. There will be less H+, right? This reaction won't happen as much. So more CO3 2- minus will stick around which can shift the reaction back this way, reforming the exoskeletons of the coral reefs, which again, are really important food chain, uh, a structure of the food chain of nearly all marine life. Okay, so it's really us, up to us to cut emissions, plant trees, do what we can to uh, limit, slow down, remove CO2 from the atmosphere to save the corals. With that, this video lecture is done.